Hello and welcome to another video on basic fiber optics. Today we're going to talk about distributed feedback lasers. Now the handheld laser we have right here is not a distributed feedback laser. It's rather called an, a fabric cavity laser. Essentially it consists of two mirrors arranged like so creating a, a cavity and then it has a, a gain medium inside some kind of semiconductor material. When we pass an electrical current into the semiconductor material it will start to emit light with sort of a broad range of um, of wavelengths and only wavelengths that sort of fit inside of the, the, the cavity will um, experience constructive interference and sort of coherent gain and begin to, to lace. And essentially that's what we're, what we're seeing here. We see that each individual wavelength here is one that actually fits inside of the cavity and we see that the sort of envelope is um, characteristic of the particular gain medium we're using here. Now this type of laser is a bit inconvenient to use for fiber optics and telecom pur purposes because it has all of this sort of very broad individual um, laser line output and it would not be nicer if we could have a laser that just emits a single very uh, very intense uh, wavelength. So in order to do that, essentially what you can do is to create what... Oh, this guy ran out. Let me turn it back on. There we go. So anyway, you can create what's called a distributed feedback laser, where instead of just having two mirrors and a gain medium, you actually create a bunch of periodic increases in the refractive index of the gain medium. Essentially what it, this does is that it ensures that only um, wavelength to sort of match the periodicity of that uh, grading we've created inside the game medium will experience um, uh, constructive interference as it bounces back and forth, all the other will just sort of be uh, interfered destructively. And that ensures that only a particular wavelength, like maybe, let's say, this one, gets uh, gets amplified, so it'll sort of steal all the power that goes into the other ones, get really strong, really intense, and we only have that one, one wavelength coming out, at least ideally. So to see that in action, let me first plug the input of the OSA out here with this handheld laser. Don't need that anymore. Oh, actually maybe before I move on we should just fix the purple trace here in place. So let me go to this one, press fix, then switch to trace A and write it. There we go. So now we can compare it with the DFB laser afterwards. So I'm gonna clean this input fiber here to the spectrum analyzer. Sorry about the wobbling because my camera is mounted on this uh, this arm and I keep bumping into it. Hopefully that's not too distracting. So now I'm gonna plug it into this fiber output here and then grab the camera. Good job. Completely butter finger here. And then we can show you this uh, DFB laser right here. So in here, inside of the mounting block, we have the actual laser diode. As I explained, it essentially just consists of two mirrors, a gain medium with some periodic ridges and creating a grading that ensures that only a particular wavelength gets coherently amplified. Now we keep inside of this uh, mount both for stability and also for mechanical protection because you can see that if you if you put too much weight or something drops on this output here that's gonna really break the device so we'll keep it safe in there. Now the plug itself has these two cables plugged into it and these are attached to this device up here in the back, as you can see. Now this device here is a laser diode controller. Essentially it does two things. It both stabilizes the temperature of the, the cavity and also supplies it with electrical current. And you can use this knob here to adjust both those factors, how hot do you want the cavity to be and how much current do you want to supply it. So first of all, let's actually try to uh, enable the laser outputs and that's gonna feed current into the, the diode. Then we can use the knob to increase the current we're supplying. Let me plug this back into the mount back here, the analyzer, so we should be able to see the spectral line appearing as I increase the current here. So that's it. 2 milliamps, 4, 5, 10. Now we're seeing something happening here. So right I'm just setting it to, I don't know, set it to 15 milliamps or something. Actually, let's go a bit further. Yeah, let's set it to 50 or something. That should be enough. Okay, so now we can really compare the outputs of these two devices, you'll see that for the handheld laser, which is the purple trace, the power difference between the two main lasing motors is very small, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's even 0 dB or 1 dB or something like that, so these are almost identical. But for the DFB laser, you can see that the, the power difference between the main lasing mode and this neighboring one is maybe, let's see, what's that, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, this is almost like 50 decibels of difference between this main lasing mode and then this secondary one. So this one's way more intense than its, its neighbor. So effectively, even though we have a little bit of a neighboring mode here, this is just a single uh, single frequency laser with quite a lot of power. Also notice that 
you can sort of imagine that all of the power that would have gone to all the other modes has sort of been just concentrated in inside of this one, which of course is very, very nice. Now, let's think about what we can actually use this DFB laser for. So, first of all, one thing that's very convenient about it is that it's tunable, meaning that if I switch this to the temperature control mode and then change this setting right here, you can see we can change the temperature of the cavity. So, why would we want to do that? Well, let's see what happens if I increase the temperature. You see that if I increase it right now, then the line will shift to the right. So we actually have a tunable laser. We can use the temperature to change the wavelength. Essentially what's happening on a microscopic level is that as we increase the temperature, then the cavity is going to mechanically expand, which means that you can sort of fit uh, longer wavelengths and more wavelengths inside of the, the cavity, which means that as a whole, all of these lines will sort of shift to the, towards higher, higher wavelengths. Another thing we can do is, of course, adjust the current we're feeding in. So if I increase it now from 50 or 48 or whatever it was, to a slightly higher value, you should see that, first of all, the power level increases like so, but I think you can also distinguish that the main line here is actually shifting slightly towards the right, which is a bit surprising, I guess. So why is it that feeding more current into the laser diode causes the wavelength to change? I guess one um, sort of hypothesis you can make in the beginning is that, well, if you feed more current into something, then you have more resistive heating because of, I guess, Ohm's law, and this heating is causing the cavity to expand, and then that's, that's why it's shifting. But actually, that's not quite the explanation, because we already established that we have temperature stabilization of this cavity. So even if I increase the, the current, it's still going to remain at the temperature we specified, because there's some kind of PID loop inside that that controls this. So resistive heating is not the reason why um, increasing the current will cause the wavelength to shift. Rather, this happens because as you, um, as you increase the amount of current flowing into the gain medium, then you have more active carriers inside the gain medium, which changes the refractive index. And essentially, um, what matters isn't just the, the length of the cavity, it's actually what's called the optical path length, which is essentially the, the length of the cavity multiplied by the refractive index. So as the refractive index increases, it's sort of effectively equivalent to expanding the cavity, even though it just means that the light propagates with a, well, more slowly inside of the, the, the medium. So anyway, increasing the current is essentially causes the um, index to increase, which in practice is the same as expanding the, the length, which causes the wavelength to shift to the right. And there's another important reason why we, we care about this effect by increasing the, the current, um, changes the refractive index and changes the wavelength. And that's something called, um, well, let me put it this way. If you want to use this uh, type of diode for doing telecommunications, one way you might do it is to sort of just turn the active current on and off. So if you want to send a one down an optical fiber, you just turn the laser on. If you want to send a zero, you just turn it off. And you just sort of blink it like that by either supplying current or not supplying current. But the issue with doing that is that as you transition from having zero current to having some current, then you need to dump a bunch of carriers into the gain medium, which very quickly causes the refractive index to, to change, which then causes the lasing uh, wavelength to, to change. So, exactly, so actually what happens is that as you turn the current on, then the wavelength sweeps, then it remains at a certain wavelength for some time, then once you turn it on, it sort of sweeps back because now the refractive index is all of a sudden decreasing. Essentially what you get is if you send out an optical pulse like this, then at the leading edge and the trailing edge, you'll have what's called a chirp, which is a rapid increase or decrease in the, uh, the carrier frequency. And then it'll be at a second frequency and then it'll sort of shift back. So this kind of um, situation where you try and pulse a laser, but then you get like a whole range of wavelengths coming out, um, is not so convenient if you're trying to do telecommunications. So typically what you actually do in order to generate pulses with a laser like this is to use an external modulator, which we'll see some more of in one of the upcoming videos. So anyway, I hope this is a nice introduction to DFB lasers and how they can be set up and utilized. Stay tuned for more.